Hello and welcome back to the national program on uh, technology enhanced learning and PTL, a joint venture of Indian Institutes of Technology and Indian Institute of Science. As you are aware, these lectures are for students in IITs and other engineering colleges and the role of humanities and social sciences is quite significant in the curriculum of engineering students. I am Krishna Barua, I teach English at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at IIT Guwahati. We are presently in the lecture series Literature and Language and this module 5 of the series is titled Literary Criticism. We are today in uh, uh, mod lecture 5 of this module uh, titled reader response. Let us go into the intention of what literary criticism is. Let us enjoy history of literary criticism, a journey we are about to undertake, undertake in this module and it is not only to revisit some of the profound sources of history of literary criticism. As we know that literature is of uh, it tells a narration of experience, human experience with all its depth, with all its variety, with all its uh, wide ranging subjects. But to understand literature, sometimes we have to locate the history within the context of the main currents of western thoughts and then the text opens up and a poem opens up and a drama opens up. Literary theory is in a strict sense or literary criticism, uh, the systematic study of the nature of literature and of the methods for analyzing literature, how we read the text, what is literature, what is a text. As a consequence, the word theory has become an umbrella term for a variety of scholarly approaches uh, to reading texts informed by various trends of philosophy and sociology. So, we go into the inter, uh, interdisciplinary uh, arenas of philosophy, psychology and sociology in understanding literature. Literary theory is the body of ideas and methods we use in the practical reading of literature. It is a description of the underlying principles, one might say the tools by which we attempt to understand literature. So, it is not only that we read a poem or a drama by itself or a novel, we have to understand the way the text has to be read. This le uh, leads to a heightened sense of appreciation and our own responses to literature. If literary theory that uh, it is uh, literary theory or literary criticism that formulates the relationship between the author and his work and it develops the significance of race, class, gender for literary study. Well, so when we look at the pre, uh, preliminary inventory of basic critical questions which all literary criticism face, it may be ontological, what is the literary works nature and mode of existence, it may be epistemological, how can we know what is the knowledge that comes out in the process or it may be theological, what is the function and purpose of the work or archaeological or descriptive where we include semiotic, uh, the meaning, the stylistic and rhetorical analysis or it may be interpretic, the, the interpretive like the hermeneutics of the work, what can be said about the extrin extrinsic relations of the work to the real world, it can be performative, how can the critic reenact or perform the work in its richest sense and in the normative process the act of judging an individual work can also implicate normative issues such as the authority of artistic canons, traditions, hierarchies of genres and so on. It may be also historical, we can look at from the lens of his history. How can the work as an event be related to other events, whether it is artistic or otherwise, which can be divided to be analytic, organic or dialectical or narrative, the construction of a coherent story or cultural and which is related question of history and so much of recent currency, psychological, the different ways mind is being uh, probed, uh, feelings, ideas, obsessions, repressions, myth, etcetera, or it can be genetic, uh, how the group minds operate or effective. 
how does the mind of the reader or the audience respond to the work and contribute to the complete completion. So, literary criticism are more or less interpretive tools that help us to think more deeply and insightfully about the literature that we read. Over time, different schools of literary criticism have developed, each with its own approaches to the act of theory. Already we had done in the previous lectures, starting from the classics, theory so called is vast and complex, historical and contradictory. At root, modern theory is not intelligible without philosophical context that go to the pre-Socratics and the classical schools. Literary criticism therefore, well, so a recap of the first lecture, classical theory. What was done? in the first lecture of this module. We had gone back to classical age of the Greeks Aristotle and Plato and thus Aristotle thought that a good tragedy has a noble hero with a tragic flaw creates some emotional catharsis uh, in the audience and considers the conventions that make up a particular literary type. So, we were doing more or less what was mimes, mimetic theory, how the imitation or uh, uh, Mimesis laid the foundations of western philosophy and Plato especially was instrumental in bringing uh, the criticism in the dialectical method. And as Andrea Nightingale had said while we had done classical criticism uh, that Plato set forth a number of ideas that have proved central to the discipline of literary criticism. The artistic representation has a different status from the people, objects and events in the ordinary world. And when we look go into the poetics of Aristotle, we had seen how he had modified, modified the mimetic theory and for Aristotle imitation is not a servile copy as it was stated in uh, Plato, but it is a copy of an uh, if even if it is a copy it is a creative process in itself. In lecture 2, we had done liberal humanism, where there was the concentration on the text as a whole, the totality of the text and also of the way that we see the text as timeless. And it can be uh, regarded as a grand narrative, which emphasizes upon the progress and liberation of humanity from a socialistic purpose. Great literature must possess the power to transcend the barrier of time and uh, place. So, these are some of the fundamental premises that we had done in lecture 2. Good literature of, is of timeless, timeless significance, the literary text contains its own meaning within itself. So, the close study of the text in its entirety and it can speak to the inner truths of each of us because of our individuality of ourself, the meaning of uh, the disinterested self comes in, the objective self comes in here and the text becomes an objective uh, area to be explored. And in liberal humanism, we have seen how form and content was fused together and they become organic parts of each other and therefore, the sincerity, the authenticity of the text is being explored and what critics do is interpret the text on so that the reader can get more out of the reading. Well, in lecture 3, we had done Marxism which champions the downtrodden of socio-economic class and this championing the championing task that support the common man in this century, the Frankfurt School's attacks on pop culture is a dehumanizing, alienating prop for the capitalist state have been influential. In lecture 4, we had done feminism, which champions the downtrodden of the war of the sexes, critiquing the patriarchal text and championing neglected pro woman literary works, more gender oriented reading even thinking which may be essentialist seeing sex or gender as socially conditioned and linguistically constructed. Well, so now we are in lecture 5 of which is titled reader response. While this opposition between theory and practice can be traced back to ancient philosophy, 
The modern emphasis on theory arises from a cluster of circumstances. This is the theory boom that has taken place in the uh, 20th century. The Levies and the angry young men of new left had little in common. If we go into new criticism, we see that they did not have much in common, but they did share the view that literature, philosophy and politics were all too serious to be left to academic amateurs. Therefore, Levisite criticism was non theoretical in that it did not share the concern of Russian formalism or its structuralist progeny, but its deep seriousness helped to create the modern definition of English literature and saved the English department in which theory still continues to flourish. This is what David Messy had written in his book. The theory boom which has changed English studies in such a way as to follow for and celebrate idiosyncratic readings as again a force to discover authorial intention or describe organic form. So, some in uh, uh, some time in the recent past there was this uh, um, emphasis upon theory to such an extent that people forgot about the actual text which we were trying to uh, interpret and were more concentrating on the theoretical aspects. In other words, all of the theories of the theory boom took the power of meaning making away from the author exclusively, but only reader response gave the power to any old reader. So, now we come to another uh, criticism reader response, where the shift is not to the text, neither to the author, but to the reader. So, it can be not the death of the author, death of the text and the death and the birth of the reader. Well, going back if we look to new criticism, where it was Wimsett and Bursley T. S. Eliot argued that authorial intent is irrelevant to understanding a work of literature. We have to see where the text was of importance, where the author even if we forgot the author, the text was of not secondary importance as in reader response. So, let us see how some of these tenets have come into the understanding of reader response. So, uh, Wimsett and Bursley had said in the essay the intentional fallacy that the design or intention if you look into the intention of the author is neither available nor desirable as a standard for judging the success of a work of literary art. The author they had argued cannot be reconstructed from a writing the text is the only source of meaning and any details of the author's desires of life are purely extraneous. This view is extremely useful in a postmodern relativist framework as it successfully makes the reader or the consumer of the story the only going against this, where the reader becomes the only authority on its meaning as opposed to the author or creator of the work. Back to the concept of effective fallacy and intentional fallacy, we have to see how it refers to the supposed error of judging or evaluating a text on the basis of emotional effects on a reader. This term was coined by Wimsett and Bursley as a principle of new criticism, which argues that a reader's response to a poem is the ultimate indication of its value. No doubt, it is the antithesis of effective criticism, which is the practice of evaluating the effect that a literary work has on its reader or audience. First defined in an article published in the Siwani Review, the concept of an effective fallacy was most clearly articulated in the verbal icon. Wimsett used the term to refer to all forms of criticisms that understood a text effect upon the reader to be the primary route to analyzing the importance and success of the text. Well, so now we come to read the response. Okay, and the reception of reader response theory in English studies going back in the background of new criticism, we will have to see it was a uh, antithesis of what new criticism had said. So, reader response was a part of two movements, the elitist theory boom of the 1970s and the populist political movement of the 1960s and 70s. If the theory boom was to remain elitist, very, very you know exclusive, it had to deauthorize reader response. If reader response was to remain populist, it had to consent to and participate in that deauthorization, where we have to see that it has to remain populist. In the 1980s, reader response was popular among 
especially in the pedagogical discourses among compositionists even as it began to lose currency among theorists. Later however, compositionists professionalized themselves by de-emphasizing or even ignoring reading. This is what Patricia Harkin had written in her essay. Reader response theory arose in large measure as a reaction against the new criticism, which we had just mentioned about intentional fallacy, about effective fallacy or formalistic approach, which dominated literary criticism for roughly a half century, which regards a piece of literature as an art object with an existence of its own, independent of its author, its readers, the historical time it depicts or the historical period in which it was written. Formalism then focuses on the text. So, new criticism its emphasis was the paradigm shift was on the text finding all meaning and value in it and regarding everything else as extraneous. To rely on readers as a source of meaning precisely what reader response criticism does is to fall victim to subjectivism, relativism and other types of critical madness. This is what those who have gone again reader response uh, emphasize. Well, so this is where the shift has come to the readers. So, it is not the text which opens up its meaning, it is the readers which make meaning of the text. So, there may be many readers, the same reader reading the text at different intervals or there may be the process of reading itself which we will be doing later and we will see that it has different meanings which are associated with it. Therefore, reader response concentrates on the reader as well as on the meaning that it generates. Readers and not only authors engage in an active process of production in use in his texts of all kinds, stories, poems, plays, building films, TV ads, clothes are received by the audience not as a repository of stable meaning, but as an invitation to make it. So, there is room always for expansion. So, it is a dynamic process, the text opens up for more meanings. The premises of reader response were promulgated first by theorists who offered generalized accounts of a universalized reader. First, they gave a very general account of who the reader is. It is of course, important for students especially, all of you must understand this to realize that their readings are shaped and even constrained by cultural and economic conditions. Well, who are these reader response critics? They take a radically different approach therefore, they feel that readers have been ignored in discussion especially in literary criticism in theory when they should have been the central concern. The argument goes something like this, a text does not even exist in a sense until it is read by some reader. This uh, brings to mind one uh, interview between Einstein and uh, Tagore and Tagore had said that the concept of beauty cannot uh, exist if there was no beholder. So, man after all is the source of the beauty, it is not landscape or the phenomena which exists by itself, there has to be a beholder. The same thing can be said about a text, it does not even exist in a sense until it is read by some reader. Indeed, the reader has a part in creating or actually does create the text. So, the whole shift has gone to you students, you are the ones who can read a text, you are the ones who can find meaning to a text, you should not be conditioned by biographical data or by the cultural literal uh, whatever environmental causes which make the text. It is somewhat like the old question posed in philosophy classes, if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, does it make a sound? Well, so reader respond critics are saying that in effect, if a text does not have a reader, it does not exist or at least it has no meaning. It is readers with whatever experience they bring to the text who give it its meaning. Whatever meaning it may have in hers in the reader therefore, and thus it is the reader who should say what a text means. We should perhaps point out here that reader response theory is by no means a monolithic critical position, it can, uh, uh, includes in itself many other lenses. Those who give an important place to readers and their responses in interpreting a work come from a number of different 
critical camps they may come not excluding formalism even formalism will come in which is the target of the habeas reader response attack. Readers response critics see formalistic critics as narrow, dogmatic, elitist, certainly wrong headed in essentially refusing readers even a place in the reading. Uh, conversely, reader response critics see themselves as Jane Tompkins has put it, willing to share the critical authority with less tutored readers. So, it becomes almost like you are uh, coming from the high pedestal to the grassroots and at the same time to go into partnership with psychologists, with linguists, philosophers and other students of mental functioning. Although reader response ideas were present in critical writing, we have seen that it was present. We will go back to the Greeks again later when we do rhetorics as a form of persuasion, which is a part of again the systematic reading of, of a text. We find that in the 1920s, most notably in that of I. A. Richards, we had done in liberal humanism, also in new criticism, and in 1930s in D. W. Harding's and Louis Rosenbaum's work, it was not until the mid 20th century that they began to gain currency. Mainly phenomenology of Husserl, hermeneutics of Gadamer and Ricoeur, reader response criticism are closely related levels. So, what is phenomenology? It is the philosophy of consciousness where subjective responses come in, hermeneutics is something where you find uh, interpretive tools in looking at any text, whether it is traditional, the Bible, or any other text, and reader response are closely related levels, all of which attempt a psycho philosophical analysis of how a reader encounters and interprets a text. Therefore, you have so many different strands in going into reader response theory, the philosophical, the psychological and also the literary. Specific schools and figures include the, include the Geneva schools, the Constance school, Jaws and Iser's reception theory, Iser's reception theory and more recent scholars such as uh, J. H. Miller and Stanley Fish. And while the general philosophical origins of this approach was uh, mainly continental, British critics uh, such as William Empson and I. Richards were doing a form of reader response criticism before the label itself became common. Making sense of what happens when we read, what is this creative process, what is this reading process? A group of texts have we have just mentioned Louis Rosenbaum's literature exploration and the reader, David Blaise's readings and feelings and subjective criticism. We have Ulf, Ulfgang Ezers, the implied reader and the act of reading. We have Stanley Fisher's Is There a Text in the Class? Very interesting. And Norman Holland's Poems in Parson and Five Readers Reading. Collectively, they were known as reader response theory and this works appeared in the late 1970s, early 1980s except Louis Rosenbaum's which appeared in 1938. Well, another special feature of reader response theory is that it is a base of on rhetorics which we had just mentioned earlier, the art of persuasion which goes back to the Socratic origins and to the Greeks. Now, the strategies devices how rhetorics and prosody are the devices where you get a reader to respond to the literary work. Wine Booth in his rhetoric of fiction has talked about the interpretive act, the effective fallacy, the critical fallacy. I. Richards in Principles of Literary Criticism had also talked about it before the level took on this, power, this term and form of criticism and interpretations of students viewpoints, how he collected all the data of the responses of the students and made it into practical criticism. Louis Rosenbaum's literature exploration advances a transsectional theory. What was that? A poem comes into being only when it receives a proper aesthetic reading, that is when readers come, come penetrate a given text. It is almost as if the text takes in meaning only when the reader reads it and then it receives a proper aesthetic reading. So, some of the more radical permutations lead to an almost complete reader subjectivism, no doubt about it. This is not objective uh, text which we are talking of 
in liberal uh, uh, humanism about the objective self, the, the meaning of disinterestedness when you look into a text, but here this is the uh, complete reader subjectivism. That means, every individual or every reader has his own way of finding meaning to the text, uh, however absurd it may be. While other versions analyze the means by which various readers arrive at a consensus regarding the meaning. So, in reader response therefore, the shift comes to the reader, to the subjective viewpoint, to the understanding of what is meaning, meaning which can then be assumed to be a pretty much correct interpretation by the ideal reader. This is uh, 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 Ezer's implied reader. So, it can be implied reader, it can be a uh, passive reader, it can be a informed reader. Reader response theory was applied to non-literary as well as literary text. So, this was applied in all disciplines. A reflection of the theoretical awareness both that the tenets used were, uh, were as applicable to essays, newspaper articles as they were to stories or to creative work. These efforts were directed at helping students. So, it is a very student friendly uh, response a literary criticism where the whole emphasis goes into the students responses and the students evaluation or reading of the text. And therefore, you are encouraged to read more to find meaning more in a text and uh, by the end of the day maybe you will be the one who will be uh, uh, defending uh, reader response more than the other formalistic approaches. As a consequence, uh, I believe in spite of his very considerable theoretical sophistication, more often than not reader response came to be associated almost exclusively with pedagogy. Naturally, because it deals with instruction, it deals with teaching. Therefore, the students are the ones who should understand the text more or should read the creative work more. So, this reading the profession. So, the shift is from writing of the author, the text to the reading process. The reading process itself becomes a sophisticated tool. It becomes a specialized uh, sort of activity. Let us review once again the basic premises of reader oriented theory, realizing that individual reader response theorist will differ on a given point. It may differ to the point that a single reader the same reader reading a text, his versions may differ from any time uh, 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 to follow. First, in literary interpretation, the text is not the most important component here. The text fades into the background, the reader is. In fact, there is no text unless there is a reader. And the reader, the text does not exist at all if there is no reader at all. And the reader is the only one who can say what the text is. In a sense, the reader creates the text as much as the author does. So, he is as much the creator of the text. This being the case, to arrive at meaning, critics should reject the autonomy of the text and concentrate on the reader and the reading process, the interaction that takes place between the reader and the text. Well, I hope it is clear by now. So, we have to discriminate here reader response theory from reception theory, which are completely uh, uh, different at the same time, um, they, uh, they merge in some uh, areas. The term reception study refers to an inquiry into a text effect on specific classes of readers, while reader response theory by contrast is properly an effort to provide a generalist account of what happens when human being engage in this process they call reading. What is this reading process? Uh, Ulfgang Ezer's the act of reading, it is a phenomenological account of the processes that occur in consciousness when human beings encounter literary text is an example. I had uh, remarked a while earlier, phenomenology is that discipline where you find that uh, it deals with consciousness, it deals with uh, different responses to the subjective uh, area of study. The premise perplexes 
people trained in the traditional methods of literary analysis. So, this was something which uh, the theorist absolutely the formalistic theories uh, theoreticians and critics did not accept and it uh, perplexed them. It declares that reading response theory is subjective and relative it is almost close to science where you cannot come to a final conclusion the text opens and it is always uh, there for you for possible meanings whereas, earlier theory sought for a much objectivity as possible paradoxically the ultimate source of this subjectivity is modern science itself even though it has no connection we can find this the theory of, theory of relativity where you find that things always there is a gap in the understanding of the text. Well, a literary text must be conceived in such a way that it will engage the reader's imagination in the task of working things out for himself. This is what Eagleton had said for reading is only a pleasure when it is active and creative. In this process there should not be any conditioning, there should not be a conditioning in that who writes the text or who is the author, it is the reader who goes into the reading of the text. In this process of creativity, he calls it the reading process, it is a creative process uh, or may go too far. So, we may say that boredom and overstrain form the boundaries beyond which the reader will leave the field of play. Reception theory examined the role of the reader in literature he writes, but was really part of a wider political concern with popular participation. Literature is therefore, becomes a performative art and each reading is a performance, it is a creative uh, area analogous to playing, singing, singing a musical work, enacting a drama, literature exists only when it is read meaning becomes an event by itself. The literary text possesses no fixed and final meaning or value, there is no one correct meaning, literary meaning and value are transactional dialogic created by the interaction of the reader and the text. According to Louis Rosenblatt, a poem is what the reader lives through under the guidance of the text. Yes, very true, do not you think so? Yeah. So, it, this reader response theory therefore, brought in a complete you know concentration on the reader on the meaning and the way that the whole reading process becomes a very interesting very dynamic form of activity. This theory of literature associated mainly with Stanley Fish later will be doing him and in slightly different form Wolfgang Iser. The central tenets of all varieties of reader response theory are that meaning is something that is contained within a text, meaning is produced by readers and according to Stanley uh, Fish there is this meaning the readers also form a community called the interpretive communities and they put them in possession of an internalized literary competence that allows them to respond appropriately to the text uh, they encounter. Reader response theory is in many ways a response to the excess of both uh, the new criticism with the vision of text as a self uh, contained monad and structuralism with a stretch on the impersonal laws and structures that govern text. This was what uh, David Messi had said. Well, just as we had uh, mentioned uh, phenomenology because uh, Ulfgang Iser will be uh, stating mostly the phenomenological approach to the reading process. Uh, therefore, let us be clear what is phenomenology uh, may be defined initially as the study of structures of experience or consciousness and uh, literally phenomenology is the study of phenomena appearances of things or things as they appear in our experience or the ways we experience things. So, there is a subjective slant to the way that we look at experience, thus the meanings things have in our experience. Phenomenology studies conscious experience as experience from the subjective or first person point of view. Well, so the phenomenological theory of art lays full stretch on the idea that in considering a literary work, one must take into account not only the actual text, but also in equal measure the action involved in responding to the text. Well, so thus Roman in garden confronts the structure of the literary text within the ways in which it can be concretely realized. The text as such offers different schematized views 
through which the subject matter of the work can come to light, but the actual bringing to light is an action of concretization. If this is so, then the literary work has two poles, one is called artistic and the other is the aesthetic. And the artistic refers to the text created by the author and the aesthetic to the realization accomplished by the reader. So, coming to the, the dominant uh, critic of this school, Ulfgang Iser, he is known for the reader response theory, especially when he formulated it in 1967. He describes the reader's contact with, uh, contact with text and the author. Uh, Iser describes the process of first reading the subsequent development of the text into a whole. So, there is this um, the process of reading and how the dialogue between the reader and text takes place. Iser's work has affinities with the so called Geneva school of phenomenological criticism, though Iser is less mystical, more scientific than the Geneva critics. Well, but like them, he privileges the experience of reading. So, reading itself takes on a beautiful experience uh, as a uniquely valuable consciousness raising activity. Reading literature gives us the chance to formulate the unformulated. Well, so this reading process argues that in analyzing literary works, the reader's response to a literary work is just as important as the text itself. All readers interpret, yes, and react to any given text differently. No uniform response would be there, which will be the same all throughout and these different reactions to the same piece of writing combine to shape the overall meaning of the literary work. This is very interesting. In addition, when a single reader interprets a text and later revisits the same piece of writing, the reader often emerges with two different interpretation of the text and its overall purpose and meaning. There was an incident which uh, one of our professors had told us in class. Uh, that he had bought a book uh, in a second hand uh, book, book store and all of a sudden he found that it was his own copy which he had sold some 20 years back. It was Wordsworth's prelude. So, the text took on different meanings when he uh, uh, as he had read it in the first half how it had covered uh, uh, so many different hands and again a reinvention of the old text which comes into uh, his hands when he rediscovers it. So, Isa also stretches the importance of the imagination of the reader. So, therefore, the reader is the implied reader or the authentic reader or the informed reader, it reads uh, rest upon that. In reading, one is forced to imagine within the mind the information being read and so one's perception is simultaneously richer and more private. So, therefore, we have so many dimensions to the reading process. It is not only the philosophical, the phenomenological, but it is also psychological. So, is there in this reading process a phenomenological approach this essay? He said that when considering a literary work, one must examine not only the text, but the response it evokes in the reader. A text has the artistic pole, which is the text and it has the aesthetic pole, which we had already done. A work of literature is thus inherently dynamic, it cannot be static, which is being conditioned by some reading or some approach. It changes depending on the reader, the text allows the reader to imagine for himself some of the components of the narrative. This is important in holding the attention of the reader. Well, from this polarity, let me quote from uh, phenomenological approach. From this polarity, it follows that a literary work cannot be completely identical with the text or with the realization of the text, but in fact, music lies halfway between the two. The work is more than the text, for the text only takes on life when it is realized. And furthermore, the realization is it is almost like music by no means independent of the individual disposition of the reader, though this in turn is acted upon by different patterns of the text. The convergence of text and reader, this is an important point, brings the literary work into existence and this convergence can never be precisely pinpointed. So, next time you read any drama or any novel, please take it into mind that you become the creator itself. You in the reading process, the way that you read the text will bring fresh meaning to
to the text. So, you become the author of the text or you become give fresh meanings to the text. So, it is the virtuality of the work that gives rise to its dynamic nature and this in turn is the precondition for the effects that the work calls for. As the reader uses the various perspectives offered him by the text in order to relate the patterns and the schematized views to one another. So, there are patterns which are going there, he sets the work in motion. So, this concretization which takes place and this very process results ultimately in the awakening of responses within himself. Thus, reading causes to literary work to unfold its inherently dynamic character that is new no new discovery is apparent from references made even in the early days of the novel. As he gives example from Lawrence Stern's remark on Tristram Shandy, no author who understands the just boundaries of decorum and good breeding would presume to think all. The truest respect which you can pay to the reader's understanding is to half the matter amicably and leaving something to imagine in his turn as well as yourself. Well, so, a literary text must be conceived in such a way that it will engage the reader's imagination in the task of working things out for himself. Two people, he gives an example, two people gazing at the night sky may, may both be looking at the same collection of stars, but one will see the image of a plough and the other will make out a dipper, right? is not it so. So, the extent to which the unwritten part of a text stimulates the reader's creative participation. So, this is almost like a creative process is brought out by an observation of Virginia Woolf in a study of Jane Austen. Jane Austen is thus a mistress of much deeper emotion than appears upon the surface. She stimulates us to supply what is not there, what she offers is apparently a trifle yet it is composed of something that expands in the reader's mind and endows with the most enduring form of life scenes which was outwardly trivial. So, you see how the reader when they read Jane Austen, this is what Virginia Woolf had said, takes on different dimension. Always the stretches laid upon character, the turn and twist of the dialogue keep us on the tenter hook of suspense. Our attention is half upon the present moment, half upon the future. Here indeed is this unfinished and in the main inferior story are all the elements of Jane Austen's greatness, where the reader um, creates his own uh, story. We have seen that during the process of reading, there is an active interweaving of anticipation and introspection. So, we go back as well as uh, uh, go look forward, which on a second reading may turn into a kind of advanced retrospection. The impressions that arise as a result of this process, which is a combination of retrospection and anticipation, vary will vary from individual to individual, but only within the limits imposed by the written as opposed to the unwritten text. So, I do not think you had uh, really taken so much of given so much of importance to the reading process. So, by this reader response uh, theory, you will understand that reading itself is something which is a dynamic process which gives meaning to a text and ultimately the whole stretch is upon the subjective consciousness of you yourself or on any other reader who reads a text. Well, continuing with Isser's uh, statement of the reading process, we find what he says. The picturing that is done by our imagination is only one of the activities through which we form a gestalt of a literary text, that is the environment that we uh, create. We have already discussed the process of anticipation and retrospection and this gestalt is not the true meaning of the text, at best it is a configurative meaning. Comprehension is an individual act of seeing things together and only that with a literary text such a comprehension is inseparable from the reader's expectation and where we have expectation there too we have one of the most potent weapons in the reader, uh, writer's uh, armory which is illusion. In our analysis of the reading process so far, we have observed three important aspects that form the basis of the relationship between reader and the the text, the process of anticipation, retrospection, then the consequent upholding, unfolding of the text as a living event and the resultant impression of likeliness. Well, if reading removes the subject object division, 
that constitutes all perception, it is only subjective, it is not object at all, the division is completely obliterated. It follows that the reader will be occupied by the thoughts of the author and this in their own turn will cause the drawing of new boundaries. Text and reader no longer confront each other as object and subject, but instead the division takes place within the reader himself. So, it is almost as if he goes into the text himself. Isa argues that this different ways in which a reader interprets and makes sense of a literary work all combine together to create a overall meaning and purpose of the text. Well, so you read Shakespeare and after all it is you who give meaning to Shakespeare. You read uh, Thomas Hardy and after all it is you who give meaning to his novels. So, reception theory while we were talking about reader response which had uh, close affinities with um, reader response. One of the most uh, greatest exponents was Hans uh, Robert Joyce is yet another kind of reader oriented criticism, which documents reader responses to authors or their works in any given period. Such criticism depends heavily on periodicals, magazines etcetera. There are varieties of reception theory, but the most uh, uh, important recent time was by Hans Robert Joss. Uh, he, he was a German in his toward an aesthetic of reception. Joss seeks to bring about a compromise between that interpretation which ignores history and that which ignores the text in favor of social histories. He talks about the horizons of expectations. Okay. These are terms which will become very, very familiar with reception theory. He describes the criteria he would employ has proposed the term horizons of expectations of a reading public. This result from what the public already understands about the genre and its convention. So, there is a uh, background to the understanding of the genre of the text in which he reads. For example, Pope's poetry was judged highly by his contemporaries who valued clarity, decorum and wit. But the next century had different horizons of expectations and thus actually called upon question Pope's claim to being considered a poet at all. Yes. So, the importance of psychology now we come to another end from philosophy, phenomenology, hermeneutics, we come into psychology in literary interpretation has long been recognized. We have seen Plato, Aristotle, Aristotle how he talked about catharsis of emotions, how he talked about uh, those that ought to be stringently controlled. Conversely, Aristotle argued that literature exerted a good psychological influence. Coming to uh, Freud, Sigmund Freud has had an incalculable influence on literary analysis, yes, which is theories about the unconscious and about the importance of sexing, explaining much human behavior. Well, but we are talking now of the unconscious of the readers, not of the writers. If however, followers, followers of Freud have been more concerned with the unconscious of literary characters or of the writers or of their people, their creators more recent psychological critics have focused on the unconscious of readers. Norman Holland is one of them. One such critic argues that all people inherit from their mother an identity theme of fixed understanding of the kind of person they are. Uh, Holland illustrated this thesis in an essay entitled Hamlet, My Greatest Creation. Holland's theory for all his emphasis on readers and their psychology does not deny or destroy the independence of the text. So, here even the reader response brings forward intervenes that the text is of secondary importance. However, Holland says that it exists as an object and as the expression of another mind. We come to another scholar, a critic David Bliss in subjective criticism, who denies that the text exists independent of readers. Bliss accepts the arguments of such contemporary philosophers of science as Kuhn, who deny the objectives fa facts exist. He even denied that there is anything which is called objective. Such a position asserts that even what passes for scientific observation or something or anything is still merely individual and subjective perception incurring in a special context. So, we are coming into this perspective of subjective and objective realm. Subjective is your own uh, individual reaction response and objective is something which is general and not connected with individual responses. Blaise claims that individuals everywhere classify things into three essential groups, objects, symbols and people. 
literature he thinks a mental creation because it is a mental creation would thus be considered only as a symbol. Well, so now we come to the last uh, uh, the uh, theoretician of reader response Stanley Fish and that really two kinds of reader response criticism one is the phenomenological approach which we had done with Wolfg uh, Wolfgang Ezer and also Stanley Fish also was uh, he characterized much of Fish's earlier work on the, the phenomenological approach. The phenomenological method has much to commend itself to us as it focuses on what happens in the reader's mind as he or she reads. Fish applies this method in his early work which was surprised by seeing the reader in paradise laws. There is much uh, change in his looking at the text in his reader response theory. In his early work he had said uh, especially this book surprised by seeing the reader in paradise laws. The supposed intent what he had said of Milton was to force the reader to see his own sinfulness in a new light and be forced back to God's grace. Fish's thesis is a rather ingenious approach to paradise laws and to Milton's misleading of the reader. Surprised by sin he had brought about the thing called effect, effective stylistics meaning in a literary work is not something to be extracted as a dentist might pull out a tooth meaning must be negotiated by readers a line at a time surprised by rhetorical strategies meaning is what happens to readers during this negotiation. It cannot be extracted all of a sudden or suddenly, but it has to be negotiated by the readers through time and by rhetorical strategies. His famous work is there a text in this class brought in new dimensions to reader response a form of criticism this is something like what you study in the classroom itself all right a form of criticism that rejects the author's intentionally and places meaning solely within the arena of those receiving the text. Thus his theory is sometimes called reception aesthetics or effective stylistics this is what he says. The reader of whose responses I speak is complex, an informed reader, neither an abstraction nor an actual living reader, but a hybrid, a real reader like me who does everything within his power to make himself informed, including suppressing what is personal and idiosyncratic and 1970-ish uh, in my response. In this book, is there a text in this class, what is really happening? is in the act of reading. Fish defines his own phenomenological approach as an analysis of the developing responses of the reader in relation to the words as they succeed one another in time, one line at a time, one another in time. His concern is with what the text does as opposed to what it means. The context for the discussion is the question of whether formal features exist prior to and independently of interpretative strategies. As one might imagine, Fish eventually offers a negative response to this question when he says, is there a text in this class? There is no text at all. He poses that rather than having a text that contains formal features and places that it is the reader that project these features into the text, thereby also answering no to the question is there a text in this class. So, now he talks about the interpretive community that creates its own reality. It is the community that invests the text, it is not an individual, but an individual who forms an interpretive community or for that matter life itself with meaning. He posits that meaning in hers not in the text, but in the reader or rather the reading community. In the procedures I would urge the readers activities are at the center of attention where they are regarded not as leading to meaning, but as having meaning. He can hold this because he believes that there is no stable basis for meaning, there is no correct interpretation that will always hold true. Meaning does not exist out there somewhere, it exists rather within the reader. So, Fish denies the text as objects and uh, which is so important to Wimsett and Birdsley and the new critics. So, the objectivity of the text is an illusion and moreover a dangerous illusion, because it is so physically convincing. So, the text does not contain meaning despite being written upon, it is a open tabula rasa you can say a blank 
slate after unto which the reader in reading actually writes the text. Yes, that is remarkable, isn't it? And that you are the one who is writing meaning, giving meaning to the text. For fish, the text can only function as a mirror that provides a reflection of its reader. So, this pre uh, suppositions of the community is the socially conditioned individual, right? Which all individuals are. This culture is referred to by fish as an interpretive community, and the strategies of an interpreter are community property. So, the interpretive community share interpretive. Uh, interpretative strategies okay? and readers belong to the same interpretive communities which shared reading strategies, values and interpretive assumptions. They may differ, but yet we find that they belong to a group. Uh, well, so there have been therefore, various approaches of reader responses to literary text. We use the psychoanalytic uh, lens, we use the feminist lens, we even use the structuring, uh, structuralist end, uh, lens. Tyson explains that reader response theory said two beliefs that the role of the reader cannot be omitted from our understanding of literature. So, it is close to pedagogy okay, that readers actively make the meaning they find in literature. So, it is the death of the author in the post structural area. Uh, when they talk of her or his displacement as the authoritarian figure in the text. So, the various responses according to John Lai that the question of in what senses a text uh, or electrons on a screen exist, the extent to which knowledge is objective or subjective, how the gap historically, culturally and semiotically between the reader and the writer is bridged and the extent to which it is bridged, the question of what the process of reading is like, what it entails and so forth. So, the interpretations at the same time the value of literary reading is conferred by kind of contract that the reader makes with a text. The reader comes to redefine some significant aspects of experience. During reading, the reader treats the text as a whole thing. So, literature is about human experience. When you read the text, it is a human experience that you find in the text, it is your own subjective response and you give meaning to the text. But, whatever happened to reader response theory? Uh, Eases elaborate description of the processes by which consciousness construct meaning as readers encounter gaps and build consistencies in literary text provided perhaps the most elaborate account of reading processes to emerge during that period. Yes, even Rosenbaum's distinction between aesthetic readings provides both students and teachers a useful way of discriminating kinds of reading activities. While at other times we read for the pleasurable experience of generating interpretations. On the other hand, they could simultaneously hold that equally uh, commonsensical notion that authorial intention is unknowable and that constructed meanings are disparate and contextualized. Very true. Today, it is fair to say that the reader response conceptions are simply assumed in virtually every aspect of our work. Bliss's emphasis on the subjectivity of criticism indeed of all reading has become commonplace by now. We no longer even expect different readers to arrive at identical reading. The new cultural ideas had their roots deep in the age of at the same time what is happening sociologically in the political sphere, uh, the portal to the land of boundless possibility. Notwithstanding that it is now a theoretical commonplace that readers make meaning that notion no longer feels very liberating yes, but a genealogical look at how reader response theory has been celebrated or rejected in English departments all over the world can tell us much about conflicted relation. Okay. So, sometimes you will find those who are the uh, people who are supporting the theorist will say that reader response theory does not stay cannot hold. So, this is between composition studies and literary studies and between research and pedagogy during the past two or three decades. What become of the populist excitement that surrounded it 25 uh, years ago or more than that? I will assume that the disappearance of reader response theory by comparison with high theory is consistent with and explicable by its having been part both as a liberatory political movement and an elitist theory boom. In his own dis the deconstruction, Jonathan Kohler had uh, made a series of observations that helped explain the profession's uneasiness with reader response. Traditional literary studies privileges what? The intelligible over the sensible, meaning over form and the invisible over the visible. 
compositionist, uh, compositionist like reader response precisely because it allowed us to empower our students. So, students become empowered with meaning and the questions that we will be doing uh, dealing with today will be how does the interaction of text and reader create meaning. What does a phrase by phrase analysis of a short literary text or a key portion of a longer text tell us about the reading experience pre-structured by uh, that text or do the sound shapes of the words as they appear on the page or how they are spoken by the reader enhance or sense the meaning of the word or how might we interpret a literary text to show that the reader's response is or is analogous to the topic of the story. What does the body of criticism published about a literary text suggest about the critic who interpreted that text and or about the reading experience produced by that text. Well, work cited most of them are from I. A. Richards principles of literary criticism, we have uh, uh, Stanley Fish and we have Peter Berry, Eagleton, Terry Eagleton, Ulfgam Izer and Balmeris Harry, Harry Balmeris. Thanks.